When it came to fighting games on the Nintendo 64, there wasn't really many options. Of course, you had big hitters like Killer Instinct Gold, but one game that didn't get the attention it deserved was Mace the Dark Age. It shares much in common with the likes of Soul Calibur and revolves around weapon-based combat. While not groundbreaking, it was a fighting game that featured some pretty hard battles to overcome. The player takes on the role of one of eight characters, or a couple of hidden ones depending on if they're unlocked or not. Whether your preference was giant axe-wielding executioners, knights, monks, samurais or assassins, the game has got it all. Their designs, while obviously medieval and somewhat morbid, were very well done. Every character has their own weapon and their own style, as well as their own stats, but they did a great job of making the game balanced. A strong character is likely to have very low speed and reaction time, while a weak character will more than likely be extremely fast. The fighting setup is made up of Street Fighter style motion with the brutalness of Mortal Kombat and then mixing it with Tekken-style combinations that require a lot of practice to perform and actually use proficiently. Now visually, the graphics are noticeably crisp. In addition to this, backdrops are partially animated with moving clouds, burning fires and flowing streams of water. But for as nice as it looks, there are several limitations that prevent it from achieving Action. Mainly the animation and frame rate, which really do suffer. This is no doubt due to the immense detail poured into the visuals, with the character movement and attacks looking rather choppy as a result. It doesn't completely ruin the gameplay by any means, and amounts to nothing more than a minor annoyance. Mace the Dark Age isn't going to blow anyone out of the water, but when it comes down to it, it does succeed in creating a competent fighting experience that any fan of the genre can enjoy. Mischief Makers is a 2D platformer from Treasure that stars a green-haired, robotic, anime-inspired hero known as Marina, along with her sidekick known as Professor Theo. Basically, your goal is to move through stages, and along the way you'll encounter gems which have various uses. Red gems are used as continues, blue gems heal you, green gems heal you more, and gold gems which are required to view the story at the end of the game. Each level has one gold gem hidden somewhere in it, and will often require some skills to grab it. This is a great addition for completionists. Of course, there's more to the gameplay than just simply collecting gems, however. You can grab enemies and throw them, and you can shake pretty much any NPC like a school bully and steal whatever gems or items they might have on them. You can also grab items that are thrown or shot at you, such as ninja stars or missiles, and throw them back at the enemy. Some stages even have an item named a clam pot, which is essentially an alchemy pot where you can make certain items necessary necessary for the stage, such as bombs. There are just over 50 levels in the game, with quite a few bosses and mini-bosses thrown in for good measure. These boss encounters are a true highlight, and bring all of the mechanics in play to the forefront. You can really see the amount of thought and effort that went into each of them, that helps make this game fun from start to finish. Many games have bosses that are either way too easy or way too hard. In this game, the bosses are definitely difficult, but they can be easily beaten as long as you take advantage of all of your abilities effectively. When the game originally released, it received a slew of positive reviews, but somehow still managed to slip through the cracks, with some of the more prominent platformers on the system being remembered far more fondly, which don't even hold a candle to it. If you manage to find it on the cheap, Mischief Makers will not disappoint. When you think about racing games on the N64, you'll more than likely think of Mario Kart 64 or F-Zero X, but there were some quality third-party titles on offer as well, one of them being Beetle Adventure Racing. Now the premise is pretty simple. In championship mode, you compete with up to seven computer-controlled cars and race across six different tracks, ranging from country roads, deserts, cityscapes and more. All of the tracks are loaded with shortcuts and alternate routes, and here lies one of Beetle Adventure's greatest strengths, finding all of the shortcuts. If you see a boarded up cave, you'd be wise to smash through it. If you see a road that leads to a different path, take it. Finding these shortcuts can not only give you a lead on the competition, but you can also find hidden crates which are valuable since they help unlock secrets and Beetle Adventure has a ton of them. Now there are two types of crates, flower and bonus. Flower crates serve as your means to unlocking one of the many cheats that Beetle Adventure has to offer. Bonus crates are your means to unlock more stages for the other modes that make up the experience and are usually hidden away amongst the many shortcuts. All of the six tracks are huge and can take about two to 
to 3 minutes per lap to complete. While some may think that's a long time for each race, this is actually a good thing since the tracks are nigh on perfect. Whoever designed these tracks should be awarded. On the visual front, Beaten Adventure Racing is a really impressive title, with most of the attention clearly being directed towards the cars themselves. With more polygons, real-time lighting, and sleek reflective surfaces, the cars shine despite the fact that they are all basically Beatles. When all is said and done, Beetle Adventure is a very solid ride on the Nintendo 64. You can spend a lot of time playing it, and even after you've finished the game and unlocked all of the cars, you'll still want to keep playing and find every single shortcut. Just like this name suggests, Hybrid Heaven is a mixture of two separate genres, mainly action and role-playing that collide to create an extremely unique adventure on the N64. Set in the year 2000, the game tells the story of a group of aliens that reside underground. They are planning to clone the president and ultimately do, just before our hero disguised as one of the foes enters the fray. Soon you find yourself in a weird, convoluted plot involving underground labs, matrix-like agents, and anime-style robots. The battles play out in a turn-based manner, with your character using martial arts-style maneuvers rather than spells when dealing with enemies. A stamina meter loads up between moves, and you are given freedom of movement in a closed space. The longer you let the meter build up, the more devastating your move will be. Battles also feature Super Mario RPG-style quick moves, such as which direction you want to roll if you find yourself on the ground. Naturally, like most RPGs, there's a ton of abilities to learn that offers the chance to grow your character, but as a special little twist, players have to learn every one of their attack moves by having them done to them first. It may hurt if your enemy grabs a hold of you and pulls a screw pile driver on you, but if you survive, you will add this move to your own list of attacks. It may seem like a bit of an odd system at first, but it really plays out in a positive way by actually promoting the option to get into as many fights as you can. On top of this, you'll be leveling up several attributes such as stamina, offensive and defensive powers, hit points and speed. This battle system will no doubt please RPG fans who are looking to get into something a bit different from the norm. On the whole, it was a really solid effort from Konami. The take on combat may not be to everyone's tastes, but at least it tried to present something different, and for those that are clicked to it, Hybrid Heaven will not disappoint. The Legend of Mystical Ninja is an adventure game in the truest sense of the word. You travel through an expansive, three-dimensional environment, beating up your bad guys with some very odd weaponry, healing your health, progressing along the path, collecting items, and conversing with townspeople along the way. It is evident that Konami did not want to throw Goman into one of those genre-bending games here, and the formula paid off beautifully. Nothing is overly complex, but nothing is so simple as to bore you to death either. You get to control up to four different characters, ranging from futuristic robots to pudgy cooks who all have their own weaponry and their own way of going about things. You can switch between the characters and tea houses, and sometimes it's really important to be using a certain character so you may need to backtrack to the nearest tea house occasionally to switch your party up. But it is this element in the legend of the mystical ninja that makes the gameplay deep and worthwhile. Unfortunately there is one area where mystical ninja falls short and that's with its replayability. Konami did not include any multiplayer capabilities at all which is fine because this is an adventure game after all but cooperative play would have been a very welcome addition to this game. It would have been a great inclusion that without doubt would have prolonged the life of the game tremendously. Now visually, Konami gave Goman a look in three dimensions that absolutely replicates his wackiness and personality from two dimensions. The entire graphical style of the game reflects this. All of the characters, environments, and even the menus have that little flair that the Goman series is known for. Every last detail is in place, right down to his spiky, unbelievably huge blue hair. Besides purposely drawing everything cartoonishly, the other big graphical statement that Konami made was absolutely vibrant colours. Nothing in this game is drab, dull, or even remotely realistic. The Legend of the Mystical Ninja is one of those little known yet great games on the N64. Most people talk about Banjo Kazooie, Super Mario 64, and Gold Knight, and yet this gem is never mentioned. Sometimes the best games, though, are the ones that nobody talks about.
The N64 was pretty well known for its incredible selection of platformers that helped the console succeed, but one that never really got its chance in the spotlight has to be Space Station Silicon Valley. In the year 2000, scientists created a huge space station called Silicon Valley, which was designed to see how well artificial animals would respond to artificial ecosystems. The result was not too well. The animals started to adapt weapons and were attacking the people living in Silicon Valley. It wasn't until a thousand years later that it returned and is now on a collision course with the planet. This is where the player jumps into the mix and takes up the role of Danger Dan, a goofy pilot, and Evo, Dan's robot sidekick. Evo has the ability to jump into animals' bodies and possess them, and this forms the main mechanic of the game. By possessing them, you can use their powers to do certain skills and complete objectives. You'll have to possess tons of animals, including dogs, floating sheep, a camel with a cannon on his hump. I could go on and on. Now when you've beaten every level of an ecosystem, you'll have to play a bonus level. Beating it will grant you a piece of Evo's body, as at the beginning of the game he's stripped of all his parts. Since there are four ecosystems and all, with every one of them having a bonus level, there's a total of 4 body parts of Evo's body. Also, each level has 15 power cells to collect, and their purpose is to power up Evo's body for the final level. If you don't get any, you'll be stuck with the weakest form of Evo, which really affects your chances of taking out the final level. This is a game with enough to keep you occupied for an insane amount of time, whether you've already beaten it or not. If you're looking for a great platformer, Space Station Silicon Valley would make a great choice. Custom Robo is a sort of virtual on styled RPG that takes the standard gameplay you would expect of the genre and combines it with intense arena based battles that end up becoming the real star of the show. Before you jump into the adventure, there's several modes that the player gets to choose from. You've got the story, arcade, as well as multiplayer, with the story offering up the real meat and potatoes of the experience. Through a series of successive battles, you will encounter and compete with numerous students, defeating each student student nets you parts from the defeated student's robot, such as dragon guns, hornet guns, and giant bombs. The type of parts one will vary from robot to robot. Each robot will typically cough up one or two of these, but rarely, if ever, a complete set. On the battlefield, your objective is to diminish the other robot's health completely. How you approach this is up to you, and often at times a lot of trial and error is involved in order to come out on top. The controls are tight, your robot responds easily to every button, with the A button being your primary weapon, B your missile, and obviously the joystick moving your robot around. It won't be long before you have the controls down, and once you do, it is absolutely seamless. Your robot responds very well to movement, and you'll never feel you were wrongly done by the controls, just rather your own mistakes. Each new weapon or accessory has its own merit and drawback. Some missiles are faster and more direct, but deal less damage. Others can track down your opponent and deal more damage, and this is just a small taste of what's on offer. When the battles really get going, you'll be amazed at how fun they are. Overall, Custom Robo is a real gem that's worth seeking out and playing. There was no shortage of quality snowboarding games on the N64, with the most prominent being 1080 degree snowboarding that would go on to garner an extreme amount of praise for its take on the sport. But it wasn't the only attempt to craft an experience on the N64 around the activity of snowboarding. Snowboard Kids is of course not a realistic take by any means, and instead focuses upon a much more playful and colourful approach. But don't let the seemingly childish aspect fool you as the gameplay that Snowboard Kids offers up is anything but simple. At the beginning of the game, you get to choose from several characters which all have their own distinct advantages and attributes that contribute to the gameplay once out on the slopes. The main difference between the sequel and the first game is the inclusion of a story mode in the second title. It's not really a story as much as it is just a series of events seen before and after races, which set up the rather fantastic lands the kids race down. You'll find yourself zooming down a huge variety of slopes, from the glistening snow of the mountains to the sizzling in the heat of the tropics, occupying each of them are numerous obstacles and course elements such as steep cliffs, jumps and waterfalls that facilitate the surprisingly deep trick system. There's a nice amount of customization that allows the player to express themselves, but more importantly, it actually translates to noticeable gains on the slopes. Overall, whilst its bigger is better approach may have the potential to come across as a bit of a mixed bag, Snowball Kids 2 is absolutely a snowboard kid game at heart. 
with gameplay near identical to that classic original. It doesn't make the first game redundant, but rather gives us more snowboard kids, and that can't be a bad thing. Quest 64 is one of those games you're either going to love or absolutely hate. Like most RPGs, you'd expect it to weave a tale full of interesting characters and plot twists that push the narrative forward. Well, Quest 64 has none of that. It sees you taking up the fight as a young man known as Brian, who's simply on an adventure to try and track down a book that disappeared along with his father. All you do is walk, then rest at an inn, and continue your walk until the next village. In this regard, Quest is just like any other RPG minus the storyline elements. For people who don't really care about story in RPGs, usually just skip the dialogue and just like to play through the adventure, then Quest 64 is perfect for you. Now the battle system is what it's known best for, and with a good reason, as it's one of the only RPGs to my knowledge using a system of this kind, and it's done very nicely. When you encounter an enemy, which happens more than it should thanks to random battles, a small barrier will surround you and the enemy inside a bigger barrier surrounding the entire arena. You can only move inside this barrier, so you might need a few turns to first approach the enemy. Once you're close enough though, a symbol will appear above the enemy's head, allowing you to attack them. It's a mix of real-time and turn-based. You and the enemy each take turns to attack, but you can actually avoid the attacks by moving around within the area. To escape battle, you simply walk out of the large barrier, and even though you have no party members, the fact you can move the character around, yet still the fights remain turn-based in nature, makes it rather enjoyable to play. On top of this, it even had a day-to-night system that not many games, especially RPGs, had back then. On the whole, if you're a fan of the genre and are looking to get your fix on the Nintendo 64, Quest 64 would make a welcome addition to your collection. Sin and Punishment is a third-person rail shooter that moves along a predetermined path as you control the teenage freedom fighters Saki and Orion, who are obviously armed to the teeth, with their blasters also working as powerful energy swords. As such, you not only shoot your enemies, but also knock their projectiles back at them, as well as slash them when they come too close for comfort. Sin and Punishment is an absolute blast to play, as long as you can handle the controls. It's not that they're bad, it's just that they can take some time to get used to. For starters, targeting enemies and moving around your character are separate actions, and you'll have to do both things well. The game kind of starts off slow, but then quickly comes into its own. By the third level, the action is intense, as you're battling wave after wave of enemies, fighting a new boss every other minute, and bringing the kill count into the thousands. For an N64 game, Sin and Punishment seriously has good visuals. The environments look beautiful, the visuals are sharp, and one level in particular displays some impressive draw distance and sense of scale. And while there's always loads of stuff happening on screen, the frame rate remains consistent. Sin and Punishment is fast, furious and short, completing the game taking less than an hour if you know what you're doing. Thankfully, the replay value is excellent and allows you to complete it on several different difficulty settings, as well as unlocking several other cool features that will encourage you to play it again. The fun factor and superb replay value easily makes Sin and Punishment worth seeking out. Well, that does it for today's video. Keep an eye out for part two as that will be coming up soon, so don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell to get notified about new videos videos. You can follow me on all of the socials which are linked below to stay up to date and also join my growing community on Discord to meet many like-minded gamers to continue the conversation with. I'd like to give a special shout out to my Patreon supporters as well. Rhino, Skill Jim, Steve, Richard, Amy, Daniel, Paul, Dio, Omar, Awesome Jacket Dude, Pierre, Carl, Strider, Game Gamecube Galaxy and Paddy J for their continued support that helps make these videos possible. If you're interested in joining my Discord or supporting the channel through Patreon, you'll find all of these links down below. As always, thanks for taking the time to check the video out. I'll catch you next time.